Hello friends, welcome to One Academy. Let's crack neat PG. I'm Dr. Shonali Chandra and uh, today the topic of discussion will be ambiguous genitalia and congenital adrenal hyperplasia like we introduced it yesterday. So uh, I've highlighted my reference code here that is SHONALI. So if you take a plus subscription and you use this code then you can avail a 10% discount on your subscription as well. Unacademy is India's largest learning platform and the advantages of taking a plus subscription is that it will give you access to unlimited live and recorded courses from India's best educators. You'll get uh, daily live classes where you can chat with your educator, you know, ask your doubts and queries and get them solved there and then. So it's like a live classroom experience. The courses are structured keeping in line with the latest NEET PG syllabus. There are also live tests and quizzes which can help you evaluate your performance as you go along and one subscription gets you unlimited access to all of the live sessions from all of the faculties who are on the platform and even if you miss out on the live sessions you can always go back and watch the recorded versions from the comfort of your own devices uh, top educators are associated with the platform like Dr. Nikita Nanwani for radiology, Dr. Mohammad Azam, Dr. Apriti Sharma, Dr. Devesh Mishra sir for pathology and all 19 subjects which we need to prepare are covered on the platform and apart from that every now and then uh, comprehensive batch courses and short duration concise crash courses they keep getting launched so you can check out the ongoing courses in our platform as well and as far as the subscription packages go there is uh, a package for everybody's needs so you can take the three months six months 12 months or 24 months subscription so if you ask me for those of you who are targeting the next and mid-year exams they can take the 12 month subscription it will give you ample time to go through all of the live sessions and even even leave you enough time in the end to revise and it turns out to be a more economical also in the longer run just uh, rupees 2083 per month and for those of you who want a slower pace of preparation uh, you're, you're, you're in your third year or final year of MBBS and still juggling hospital duties and classes and clinics and uh, you know, schedules and so forth. So you can take the 24 month subscription. It will turn out to be far more economical in the longer run, rupees 1250 per month. And if you subscribe using my code, that is S-H-O-N-A-L-I, then you can get a 10% discount on whatever subscription package that you choose from. So coming back to the session at hand today, Osborne, hello, uh, Pranav, Tahira, Rohan, hello everybody. I welcome you to the YouTube session. And uh, <clears throat> today we're going to be talking about ambiguous genitalia. And one, uh, top, one topic which I have referred to here and there when I'm talking about the differential diagnosis of PCOS also, I've referred to this. I've talked about this in hirsutism also. And then I said that I will be taking up a detailed session on that. So that is what we're going to discuss today, congenital adrenal uh, gland hyperplasia. Now, this topic A is important because it's asked in exam especially AIMS uh, examination they're pretty fond of asking this so they have asked various aspects of the topic but not going into too much depth and details but uh, you know even then this topic becomes more of a challenge to understand which I feel is because this is something that we don't see too often or hardly ever we see uh, in clinical uh, practice right so all throughout uh, our MBBS years you know this it remains a mystery to us because we've not actually seen it in the clinics and that's why the problem is that it becomes much of a more theoretical and endocrinologically driven uh, topic so sometimes the concepts are a little bit uh, difficult to grasp but now that we have talked about the genital tract development now that we've already talked about the development of the sex I think ambiguous genitalia should much make more sense to you so what exactly is ambiguous 
Lewis genitalia. Now, like I introduced the concept to you in yesterday's session, that ambiguous genitalia is that when we are not able to tell whether it is a male genitalia or whether it is a female genitalia. Now, sex of the newborn is determined the moment that the child uh, takes birth just by looking at the external genitalia. If it's female, we label say, yes, you've got a female child. If it looks male external genitalia, we say, yes, the woman has de uh, delivered a male boy. Uh, but if we are not able to tell uh, whether it is exactly male or female, we term it as ambiguous, something in between. So there are varying degrees of ambiguous genitalia, right? Now, see, uh, undifferentiated external genitalia, male external genitalia on one hand and female external genitalia on one hand. So these are the two extremes. Anything in between is ambiguous and there can be varying degrees of this ambiguity. It could be more in a more look like femaleish types, right? But there could be something like this, that there is a, a labia, I can see here a bifid structure, that's the labia majora, but the clitoris doesn't seem normal at all. It seems as as if there is a clitoral hypertrophy all right or sometimes it could be more like in the more towards the male spectrum where there could be a longer penis and on the other hand the scrotum might look bifid so it might be a bifid scrotum and if there's a penis there are varying degrees now where does the urethra open sometimes the urethra opens usually the urethra opens at the tip of the penis but this urethra can also open under the shaft of the penis right so it could be a hypospadias so there are varying degrees of ambiguity that can be identified after birth all right now let's keep that aside and think about how such scenario will occur now the yesterday we discussed that in the development of sex it is the androgens which are getting secreted in the male fetus which are responsible for uh, male external genital differentiation and in the female fetus it is the mere absence of androgens which results in a female external genital differentiation so the whole interplay is between the production or presence of androgens so in a female fetus if there is too much androgens Androgens, okay excess of androgens or if in a male fetus there is too little of androgen that is responsible in a nutshell to lead to ambiguous genitalia now there could be various causes for a female fetus being exposed to too many androgens and there could be various causes for a male fetus to have too little of androgen production right so this is uh, the spectrum of the external genital development that I was talking about. So on one extreme, we have the complete female external genitalia. On the other extreme, we have a completely male external genitalia. And in between are these areas of ambiguity, which we call as the varying degrees of ambiguous genitalia right now whenever i find an ambiguous genitalia in a newborn what you need to understand here first is your you will immediately think about what are the gonads where are the gonads so that's the question that should pop in your mind as to what is the gonad is it testes all right where is this testes located this testes could be located in the abdomen this could be in the abdomen, this could be in the inguinal canal or this could be here underneath the labia in this situation or underneath the scrotum. So this could be in the labioscrotal fold. It could be in the labioscrotal fold, right? So any gonad which is found in the inguinal canal or in the labioscrotal fold is bound to be a testis, right? Now, the next question that arises is whether it is ovaries. Then the next thing that you should uh, ask yourself and the next question that should pop in your mind is what is the genetic sex? Is it XY male or is it XX male? female now the reason why these questions should pop in your mind is simply because just let me raise this much yeah 
So the reason that these questions should pop in your mind is because if it's a male fetus with testes, then probably the reason for ambiguous genitalia is deficiency of androgen production or action. And if it's a female fetus with ovaries, who's ended up having an ambiguous genitalia, then the cause is exposure in the intrauterine life to excess of androgens. Exposure to excess androgens in the intrauterine life. Now, my main focus of today's discussion is going to be about a female fetus being exposed to excess androgens leading to ambiguous genitalia because I want to talk about congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia. But before moving on to that, let me just give you some brief terms which are often asked in the PG entrance examinations. Now, traditionally, this ambiguous genitalia was often referred in terms of intersexuality. One, it was identified that either there is a male sex or there is a female sex and in between is intersexuality. Uh, now, of course, we know gender and gender identity to be more fluid, but I will not go into that aspect of discussion uh, because... Um, Yes, on C, I'm coming to that. I will not go into that aspect of uh, uh, development because a lot more goes into gender identification and uh, other than just the anatomy or embryology, right? So traditionally, yes, intersexuality was described as either being true hermaphroditism or pseudo hermaphroditism. Now, hermaphrodite, uh, hermaphroditus was the god in Greek uh, scenarios where you know he was the god with bisexual uh, tendencies and also with bisexuality and you know both the uh, sexual organs so the name comes from there but yes uh, in current usage this term is really avoided but anyways intersexuality had been traditionally described to be of two types true hermaphroditism and pseudo hermaphroditism in true hermaphrodites it was seen that they had bilateral ovo testes their gonads were a mixture of testes and ovarian elements or there could be an ovo testes on one side and on the other side there could be an ovary or testes. Now depending upon the gonad that is present, the internal genitalia or the duct development of that side will progress respectively. So for example, if on one side there is ovary, on that particular side the molarian duct will develop and if on the other side there is testes or ovo testes then depending upon on how much uh, androgen is getting produced, the Wolfian duct will develop in uh, in uh, uh, adjacent to that gonad, right? So that is how the internal genital development was directed in these individuals, and majority of them uh, are found to have a normal XX karyotype. But even then, their gonadal development is uh, disrupted and abnormal, and that is why they end up having uh, sexual characteristics in internal and external genital uh, characteristics of both the sexes about 10 to 40 percent of these individuals have uh, mosaics so 20 to 40 percent are mosaic majority have xx karyotype only and depending upon the degree of exposure to androgens they might have ambiguous genitalia of varying extents and varying degrees on the other hand, pseudo hermaphroditism uh, was described as when an individual had gonads of one sex and the phenotypic appearance of the other sex, right? So it was called as a female pseudo hermaphroditism when the gonads were ovaries and the external genitalia is male. And it is called as male pseudo hermaphroditism when the gonads are testes and the the external genitalia in turn is female like now in pg examinations for you guys who are preparing for neat they do ask you this question that what is the most common cause of male pseudo hermaphroditism so the most common cause is androgen insensitivity syndrome that is complete androgen insensitivity syndrome and we had an extensive discussion on this yesterday and for female pseudo hermaphroditism the most common cause where the gonads are ovaries the uh, karyotype is also xx but the external genitalia turns out to be male the most common cause is congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia all right so this is what I am going to talk about next
now when can a female fetus become virilized when can a female fetus become virilized like i told you whenever there is excess of androgens now the source of that androgens could be from the mother now the mother mother's blood stream is in contact with the fetal blood stream across the placental barrier so whatever the mother eats whatever the mother uh, gets exposed herself to invariably the fetus is also exposed to the same substances so any source of androgens in the mother excessive source of androgens in the mother can also lead to excess androgens seeping into the fetal circulation and the female fetus could become virilized for example if the mother takes uh, androgenic drugs for example if there are uh, uh, androgen uh, producing tumors uh, androgen producing tumors in the uh, mother like uh, ovarian tumors or adrenal gland tumors uh, on c pcos will not lead to such dramatically high androgen levels to uh, you know cause virilization of the female fetus pcos is so common but female fetus virilization is not that common that is self explanatory that in pcos the androgen levels are not sufficiently high to be able to cause female fetus virilization in the first place and secondly uh, the reason uh, why why in most of these situations female fetus uh, virilization is not so common is because the placenta has an enzyme that is called as aromatase the placenta has an enzyme that is called aromatase on say i'm answering your question here they do have uh, aromatase and that aromatizes the excess of androgens to estrogen so it's like a fail safe mechanism so the fetus the placenta can do it uh, for the fetus as well protecting it from the harmful effects of androgens if ever they are in excess but one situation where the placenta is not able to protect the fetus against these androgens is when the source of androgens is in the fetus itself and that is congenital adrenal hyperplasia so mind you this congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia is in the fetus the fetus is suffering from this disorder and because the fetus is suffering from this disorder it is producing excess of uh, adrenal gland androgens and and causing the female fetus to get virilized now the another point that i want to make here is congenital adrenal hyperplasia mind you is an autosomal recessive disorder so both the partners both the mother and the father need to be carriers to be able to have a fetus who will suffer from congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia so it's an autosomal recessive disorder now that also goes on to say that the male fetus could also be affected with congenital adrenal hyperplasia so do not think mind you that congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia is only going to affect the female fetus it can also affect the male fetus but the male fetus will not get uh, the the male fetus will not be bothered by the excessive androgens the problem of virilization is limited to the female fetus only okay so please get that one thing also clear that it's an autosomal recessive disorder both male and female fetuses can have this congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia but the problem of virilization is only when the fetus is female and the most common enzyme deficiency question question in neat pg the most common enzyme deficiency that is responsible for this condition is deficiency of an enzyme which is called as 21 alpha hydroxylase very good subhash you are rightly saying 21 alpha hydroxylase other enzymes like 11 beta hydroxylase and uh, 3 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase and dehydrogenase enzymes could also be deficient but these are less common enzyme deficiencies most common is deficiency of 21 alpha hydroxylase enzyme now let us dig in a little deeper and find out how this uh, affects the female fetus right so talking about the steroid pathway all right all steroid uh, hormone synthesis begins from the uh, primary molecule that is uh, cholesterol so let's say that this is the adrenal gland here and this is the hormone production pathway so i've just summarized it here for you what i want to point out here is that uh, pregnenolone converts to uh, the uh, androgen side of production hydroxypregnenolone dhea 
and androgen subsequently by first getting acted upon by 17 hydroxylase enzyme and the androgens this DHEA gets converted to androgens in the presence of 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase pregnenolone gets converted to progesterone by first getting acted upon by 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase enzyme progesterone gets further converted to hydroxyprogesterone by the enzyme 17 alpha for hydroxylase so these two enzymes they act all uh, the, these two enzymes 17 hydroxylase and 3 beta hydroxy dehydrogenase they act on pregnenolone to ultimately result in production of androgens from the adrenal gland now in the adrenal gland this androgen production is taking place in the medulla of the adrenal gland similarly in the cortex of the adrenal gland what happens is that this progesterone and hydroxy progesterone is diverted to towards the production of uh, mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids. So uh, that is what is going to happen. Progesterone is getting diverted into the production of, I think that is opposite. Uh, this is aldosterone here and this is cortisol here. Okay, so progesterone and hydroxyprogesterone get diverted towards the production of aldosterone cortisol, which are the corticosteroid hormones by the action of the enzyme 21 alpha hydroxylase. Now, what will happen if this enzyme is deficient? If this enzyme is deficient, that means the fetal adrenal gland, right now we're talking about the fetal adrenal gland. So the fetal adrenal gland does not synthesize these uh, mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids, right? So what will happen? There will be a deficiency of these corticosteroid hormones that will be sensed by the fetal pituitary gland. So there will be a feedback stimulation of the fetal pituitary and the fetal pituitary in turn will start synthesizing more and more of adrenocorticotropic hormone that is ACTH in an attempt in an attempt to synthesize more of corticosteroids but the problem here is that there is 21 hydro, uh, 21 hydroxylase deficiency so even if this increased amount of ACTH is being synthesized this deficiency cannot be corrected on the other hand what happens is that there is fetal adrenal gland hyperplasia in response to this excess ACTH production and because mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids cannot be synthesized what happens is that all the uh, all the uh, all the enzyme machinery is getting uh, diverted to produce excessive amounts of androgens right so that is what happens because of fetal adrenal gland hyperplasia there is excess of androgen production and this excess of androgen production is going to cause the masculinization of a female fetus all right so this is about the pathophysiology of congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia and understanding this flow chart of the steroid production you can also understand that there is collection in the serum collection in the serum or in the bloodstream of uh, substances like 17 hydroxy progesterone so 17 hydroxy progesterone levels which are one step before the enzymatic block right one step before the enzymatic block 17 hydroxy Oxyprogesterone levels increase in the bloodstream and these levels can be tested in the bloodstream to make the diagnosis of congenital adrenal gland hyper. So this is about the pathophysiology of CAH, right? Now, I want to ask you one question. I want to ask you one question and I think that you should be with a little bit more thinking, you should be able to answer this question. Why does this cause virilization of the external genitalia only or affect the development of urogenital sinus only and it does not interfere with the development of the Wolfian duct? Why is that with congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia only the external genitalia gets affected or the development of urogenital sinus only gets affected and it doesn't happen that a female fetus uh, gets on to develop have the development of wolfian duct why not the wolfian duct or the mullerian duct development gets affected
on say you are saying absence of sry gene on the y see there is of course there is incongenital adrenal gland hyperplasia it is a female fetus if it is a female fetus it is xx so i agree that there is no y chromosome no sry but that will result in formation of ovaries the gonads are ovaries in these females with congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia so they are normal ovaries so obviously they do not have sry but the reason why the excess androgens are not affecting the wolfian duct development is because the adrenal gland is because the fetal adrenal gland fetal adrenal gland starts to function after 10 weeks of gestation all right subhash you saying uh, external tahira somebody saying pranav singh absence of amh factor released by certain cells i agree with you because of absence of amh factor the mullerian duct develops that is true why what i am asking you is why doesn't this excess androgen cause in turn development of wolfian duct why not that happens that doesn't happen because the fetal adrenal gland starts to function after 10 weeks of intrauterine life by then the mullerian duct has already developed and the wolfian duct has already regressed by then the internal genital tract development is already complete is already complete so that is the reason why congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia affects the development of the urogenital sinus only or the external genital uh, genitalia only and does not interfere with these excess androgens they do not interfere with the development of the internal genitalia now how is the diagnosis made like i discussed the diagnosis can be made by testing for serum hydroxyprogesterone levels and sometimes if the uh, serum hydroxyprogesterone levels are unequivocal and they are not raised in the abnormal range and we still have a doubt about this diagnosis we can use the acth stimulation test also to make the diagnosis of this syndrome now what is the clinical presentation of congenital adrenal hyperplasia now clinical presentation is how is the newborn going to be affected now see all of this virilization has happened in the intrauterine life all right uh, the deficiency of mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids has also happened in the intrauterine life but the fetus can use the mother's uh, hormones for that purpose so the fetus is not affected much often except for the fact that there is virilization of the female fetus but the clinical presentation uh, will happen at the time of birth or at the time of puberty depending upon whether the enzyme deficiency is complete or partial so in the uh, def- uh, when the enzyme deficiency is complete it leads to classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia it presents in newborns and in the most severe form of enzyme deficiency or there could be a less severe form of enzyme deficiency or there could be a least severe form of uh, congenital the adrenal hyperplasia where the deficiency is only mild all right the enzyme deficiency is partial and in the least severe form it will lead to non class non classical congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia which presents during puberty with features of androgen access and it forms a differential diagnosis of pcos because of this reason that it presents during puberty with features of androgen excess it can also lead to uh, you know uh, precocious pubertal development in young girls uh, uh, because of excess of androgen productions around the time of puberty so that's about non classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia but classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia presents in newborns and in the most severe form it uh, uh, in the most severe form it leads to a salt wasting form of co- classical congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia where in addition to virilization in addition to virilization of the female fetus there will also be features of adrenal insufficiency now you can understand that these newborns be it male or female which have been affected with classical congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia they are deficient in 
the life saving hormones which we have in our body which are glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids so they will have features of adrenal insufficiency as well like failure to thrive dehydration hyponatremia hyperkalemia so this becomes called classical congenital hyper uh, classical ch especially if it's in the most severe form because of adrenal insufficiency becomes a life threatening condition it's a life threatening condition in the less severe form there can be only simple virilizing form where the uh, classic features of adrenal insufficiency are not there and only the virilization of the female fetus has taken place so there can be varieties of clinical presentation of congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia depending upon how severe is the enzyme deficiency all right now let's talk about the management of classical congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia and we're going to talk about let's say about the salt wasting form so how is the management of a newborn with classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia is being done so there is definitely deficiency of corticosteroids right so this deficiency needs to be corrected so we have to give enzyme replacement we have to correct this deficiency okay supply these hormones from the outside now once we do that once we do that then the features of adrenal insufficiency are also taken care of and other than that this stimulation feedback stimulation in the pituitary is also eliminated the adrenal gland hyperplasia is also resolved and the excess androgen production is also resolved so we don't want the uh, female fetus which has already become virilized to continue getting virilized further right so it will take care of both the things if we correct this deficiency so what is needed a hormone replacement therapy has been is required and that has to continue lifelong mind you it has to be started in the newborn life and has to be continued lifelong mineralocorticoid replacement and glucocorticoid replacement is required mineralocorticoid uh, replacement is usually done with the uh, fludrocortisone and the glucocorticoid replacement in the newborn life and childhood is done by this hydrocortisone is done by hydrocortisone because it is short acting and it avoids the uh, potential side effects of long steroid long acting steroids so during childhood and newborn life the glucocorticoid replacement is done with hydrocortisone and then obviously we have to take care of the uh, growth of these uh, newborns also and growth during childhood another aspect if you ask me what to do about the virilization on the virilization that has already taken place unfortunately has to be corrected with cosmetic uh, surgery and treatment a surgical treatment cosmetic surgical treatment plastic surgery so that is about the management of a newborn with classical ch and again a scenario that has been asked in the neat pg exam as well what if the woman already has an affected child with classical congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia so let's say there is a normal woman who is herself a carrier probably that's why she has a child history of a child with classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia then for this woman the main concern is that she doesn't want this to happen to the next baby that she conceives right so her concern is how can we prevent another virilized fetus and the problem of virilized fetus will only arise if she's carrying a female fetus mind you on that as well so the other important aspect here i want to tell you is that the way to prevent the virilization is to come back to the chart earlier way to prevent virilization to prevent this is to prevent this excess androgen production for that you have to correct the deficiency of corticosteroids for that you have to give these corticosteroids to the fetus if you want to prevent fetal virilization these corticosteroids need to be given to the fetus so can you give them to the fetus directly 
you are going to give it to the mother if she gets pregnant again if she gets pregnant again you have to give it to the mother so you have to start treatment of the pregnant woman and the most important aspect to remember here is that what is the drug that you're going to give now the drug that you have to give is a steroid is a corticosteroid but you cannot give hydrocortisone and you cannot give the shorter acting drugs which are metabolized by the placenta you need the drug that the mother is going to take to be able to reach the fetus so you have to give dexamethasone and that's why the drug of choice in this scenario is dexamethasone because this drug is not metabolized by the placenta so the pregnant woman takes it and it can cross the placenta and reach the fetus and do the job of this drug that it is supposed to do so the drug used is dexamethasone and the direct question has been asked from this in neat pg examination the other important thing to note is that the treatment should begin as soon as pregnancy is diagnosed because if you're going to start this treatment later not later than 20 uh, not later than nine weeks if you start it beyond nine weeks, by that time, by that time, you know, the ductal development, the urogenital tract development and the adrenal gland activation will already start. So you cannot start this treatment later than nine weeks. Preferably, it is started as soon as pregnancy is diagnosed and the earliest that a pregnancy is diagnosed is usually when the urine pregnancy comes, uh, urine pregnancy test comes negative so as soon as the urine pregnancy test come negative that is preferably by four to five weeks of gestation you should be starting this treatment drug treatment that is dexamethasone now the other important thing here to note is that this woman is pregnant right now we don't know whether she is carrying uh, a female fetus in the first place or whether she is carrying uh, an affected fetus also in the first place right so we have assumed right now early on in pregnancy when we've started the drug treatment we don't know whether she's carrying a female fetus whether she's carrying a male fetus or whether she's carrying an affected fetus at all therefore these women are then subjected to chorionic villus sampling now chorionic villus sampling Sampling is done somewhere between 10 to 13 weeks of gestation and from that the chorionic tissue is analyzed genetic analysis of the chorionic villus sampling tissue is done sex determination and genetic testing is done and if it's a male fetus remember a male fetus will not be bothered by virilization an unaffected female fetus because it's an autosomal recessive condition so if both the partners are carriers right there's both the partners are carriers there is still a probability that they could have a normal fetus they could have an unaffected female fetus so if it's a male fetus or if it's an unaffected female fetus the treatment needs to stop then there is no need to continue this dexamethasone treatment for the remainder of the pregnancy but if the sex determination and genetic testing tells us that the female fetus is affected then we continue the treatment throughout the pregnancy and this is how we prevent another virilized fetus from taking place now uh, i saw this um, uh, uh, on c you had said that genetic counseling genetic counseling is possible before uh, the before such a woman conceives so we can take the uh, genotype of both the uh, partners and we can assess the possibility uh, but see what will you do by genetic counseling even if you do genetic counseling the other option that you are offering to the woman is let's have an IVF and implant the normal embryos and do the same things do the same genetic testing and sex determination in the lab and then implant that embryo in the uterus I would say that um, I would say that that has uh, uh, that has potential uh, but again that will we will go through the it's like holding the nose like this we are going to do the same thing but go through the other route which would be probably more um, more costly also whereas if she gets pregnant on her own again there are likely chances that she could have by herself an unaffected female fetus or she could have a male fetus and then there's no problem of virilization at all you know so the odds are i would say in favor of starting the treatment when she gets pregnant again 
okay so this is about called classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia and its management all right and these two aspects i have discussed in detail because these two aspects the management of uh, a, a woman who has a previous child with classical congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia and management of a newborn these two aspects of this disorder have been asked in your neat pg and aims exams already right so that's why i have taken this time to discuss this topic and another time another important thing is that when we will talk about this uh, when we talk about the differential diagnosis of PCOS there also the reference of classical con uh, of uh, non classical uh, CH had come so this is the same disorder there the treatment of non classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia there would be along similar lines with corticosteroid that is prednisolone uh, treatment there to you know suppress the uh, ACTH stimulation of the adrenal glands now let's see some questions here Let's see some questions. The basic information about ambiguous genitalia I have provided to you. So it's a very detailed and extensive topic, all right, which I somehow feel that cannot be covered in a one hour session or something like that and it's 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 an unnecessary detail also as far as for those of you who are preparing for neat pg is concerned what you need to have is the basic understanding of ambiguous genitalia clear why it can happen and what are the potential causes and from there you can extrapolate all right so um uh, before moving on to this question, Tahira, I can see your question here. Chance of female and male fetus having congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia. Now, see, uh, what is the chance of male and female fetus having? See, it will get determined if, if, if there are two individuals, the male and the female, the mother and the father, they both are carriers. They both are carriers. It is autosomal recessive transmission, right? So, uh, the risk of having an affected male and female fetus would be equal almost right but the fact is that uh, the female fetus getting virilized the chance of that would be about one in eighth about one in eighth about one in fourth chances of getting infect uh, getting uh, getting affected and one in eighth of getting uh, uh, affected with virilization so you will have to trace the uh, trace the genetics of it because uh, you'll have to see if both are both the mother and father are just carriers or if the uh, female is herself suffering from congenital adrenal hypergland gland hyperplasia and then she's conceiving so that will determine what is the risk of the male and female fetus getting affected so once they are carrying that gene you know you have to understand that it they have to carry the affected gene from both the parents to get affected so uh, in a nutshell i do remember that yes female fetus getting affected and virilized the risk is about one in eighth if both the uh, partners are carriers okay now let's take the this question now a newborn is found to have a clitoral enlargement and some degree of labial fusion. What is the first step in arriving at a diagnosis? Perform a karyotype, perform an ultrasound, perform blood hydroxy progesterone levels or perform serum testosterone levels. Yes, I want you people to attempt to answer this question a newborn is found to have clitoral enlargement and some degree of labial fusion that means the newborn is having ambiguous genitalia what is the first step in arriving at the diagnosis what will help you delineate your alignment of causes very good tahira perform a karyotype because the first thing that you want to find out is whether it was a male fetus which remained under virilized or whether it was a female fetus which actually got virilized so that is why the first step is to perform a karyotype if your karyotype it tells you that it's a female fetus then you'll start looking for causes of virilization of a female fetus if your karyotype tells you that it's a male fetus then you'll start looking for causes which have caused this male fetus to remain under virilized so perform a karyotype and yes subhash sex determination by using a karyotypic sex determination a genetic sex determination is what is required to be done here 
Moving on to the next question. A newborn is found to have clitoral enlargement and some degree of labial fusion. The karyotype is XX. What is the next step in arriving at the diagnosis? Now, the karyotype is XX, okay? So, it is a female fetus which has gotten virilized. What is the next step? Perform a gonadal biopsy, perform an ultrasound, perform blood 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels or perform serum testosterone levels. Yes, I can see people answering Subhash and Tahira rightly saying perform blood 17 hydroxy progesterone levels because your suspicion here is the most common cause of ambiguous genitalia in a newborn. Most common cause of ambiguous genitalia in a newborn is congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia. Further confirmed by finding a karyotype that is XX and to make the diagnosis you need to perform blood 17 hydroxyprogesterone acetate levels which are going to be raised in case of congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia because this is a condition which has the potential of causing adrenal insufficiency also. That is why it is very very important to immediately do these blood levels and rule out the diagnosis of CA. H. All right. So very good. You can't guys have answered this correctly. Let's see the next question. There's a two year old child uh, with hirsutism. So two year old mind you two year old child with hirsutism, clitoral hypertrophy and some degree of label fusion. The karyotype is XX. The serum hydroxy progesterone levels are raised. What is the most appropriate treatment? Should you treat with glucocorticoids after puberty? Should you commence the treatment with glucocorticoids straight away? Should you give a high salt diet or should you treat with estrogen? What is the most most appropriate treatment of this child right now based on these options that are provided based on these options that are provided yes Tahira rightly said commence treatment with glucocorticoid so you have to give those hormone replacement ideally we will also have to assess the need of mineralocorticoid uh, replacement as well but that's not given in the option so um, commence treatment with glucocorticoids is the best choice among these options and obviously um, yes so this is about the treatment with glucose uh, this is about this question here so let's see if we have any other question yes we have I think the last question of the day now a woman has come for antenatal visit she had her LMP five weeks ago and she is urine pregnancy test positive she has a child affected with congenital adrenal hyperplasia she is very concerned about her current pregnancy what should be done nothing can be done now she should have come before conceiving start her on dexamethasone therapy immediately start her on dexamethasone therapy after confirming the sex at 12 weeks or there is no risk to the fetus at all so what do you do in this circumstance now yes subhash rightly said start her on dexamethasone therapy immediately right so she should be started on the therapy now this is uh, this therapy has been initiated in, uh, immediately because we as of yet do not know whether or not she is carrying an affected or unaffected female fetus or whether she is carrying a male fetus. We don't have that information but the important thing is that this treatment will work only if it is given early on in pregnancy preferably it should be started by 4 to 5 weeks not later than 9 weeks like I already told you. So that's why this treatment needs to be started immediately. The risk of the fetus to the, to the risk of the fetus getting affected with this disorder is definitely there right so this is how questions are framed or have been framed in the past in congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia and ambiguous genitalia now for suggested reading for those of you who are interested to know about what are the causes of a male fetus remaining under virilized you know you can 
and think about in the direction when I talked about the development of sex I told you that the male fetus XY should develop male testes of uh, testes as the gonads and these gonads should synthesize androgens and so on and so forth so any defect in the pathway in this pathway any deficiency of androgen producing uh, hormones any deficiency of uh, partial deficiency of andro androgen producing uh, uh, recept uh, androgen acting receptors 5 alpha reductase deficiency so anywhere along the line if the androgen production is interrupted then it can lead to ambiguous genitalia so you can understand that there can be hordes of causes and hordes of uh, you know enzymatic abnormalities that are there and that's why I say that it goes beyond the scope of discussion for neat PG but for those of you who are interested can read up on that but I've provided you the basic understanding of the concept so I think that should be enough as far as neat PG exams are concerned all right so thank you guys that's been my session if there are any doubts and any doubts that i have missed reading please uh, please um, you know uh, just um, send them to me here and everything and i'll read them and i'll get back to you regarding that Okay, Tahira, I think I, I, Tahira, I think a doubt that you have raised here is about the uh, external genitalia being under control of dihydroxytestosterone. Yes, it is under the control of dihydroxytestosterone. And whenever there are excess androgens, these androgens will get converted into those labioscrotal folds. That labioscrotal fold, that tissue of the labioscrotal fold is rich in the enzyme 5-alpha reductase. So it will get converted whenever there are excess androgens to dihydrotestosterone and therefore capable of causing virilization of the external genitalia. In the undifferentiated stage, the external genitalia does have uh, a good quantity of 5-alpha reductase enzyme which is responsible for conversion of androgen to, uh, for conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, right? So those that enzyme 5-alpha reductase is inherently present in the developing external genital tissues. So I think that should answer your question there. Okay, Subhash, you want to know about the ACTH stimulation test? Well, I'll give you in brief. So let's say, see the traditionally the levels that are considered to be diagnostics or diagnostic of congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia in a newborn. In a newborn, if the uh, levels of 17 O hydroxyprogesterone are more than 3500 nanogram per deciliter, then the diagnosis of uh, congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia is certain. And in normal levels, levels are usually less than 100 so if the levels are more than 100 but they are less than 3500 so they are unequivocal if the levels of 17 hydroxyprogesterone are unequivocal then we can do the ACTH stimulation test what is done is that an ACTH injection is given to the newborn and uh, uh, repeat 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels are tested in the serum so after giving ACTH stimulation there is a dramatic rise in 17 OHP levels so initially if these levels were in the unequivocal uh, unequivocal range they will rise beyond the diagnostic range so that is the logic of giving the ACTH stimulation test which causes an increase dramatic increase in 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels in the serum okay all right so i can see if there are no further questions i will uh, bid you goodbye i hope that uh, this uh, topic which is more of i can understand it's more of theoretical and i myself had been absolutely scared of the steroid pathway um, uh, cholesterol and pregnenolone and progesterone I mean this was the most difficult pathway I had to memorize in biochemistry in my first year so I can understand but trust me guys that this is your most important if any pathway that you need to remember is this 
congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia or adrenocortical disorders they are a very important topic from medicine aspect also for your exams you know so adrenal gland hormones are extremely extremely important that is why this pathway is also extremely important so remember the gist of the pathway that from cholesterol there can be uh, prognenolol is going to come next and it will go two ways it will go towards the progesterone side or towards the androgen side and then you know so you'll have to remember it and summarize it and remember it's it's very very important it forms the foundation of a lot of understanding about adrenal gland disorders and about congenital adrenal gland hyperplasia which is otherwise an adrenal gland disorder but has implications in gynecology as well all right so thank you guys and uh, i just want to tell you that uh, the plus course that i have launched on the subscription platform did start uh, yesterday so those of you who want to join can join me there on the platform uh, every uh, every day at uh, 8 pm it's a capsule course on high risk pregnancy where i am talking about the various aspects of high risk pregnancy the medical disorders and the obstetric disorders dealing with high risk pregnancy so you can find me there on the plus platform as well and lastly before leaving i would advise you to make use of the platform as much as possible to help you prepare for neat pg so subscribe and you can use my code s h o n o l i and get a 10% discount on your subscription by using this code as well so thank you guys thank you so much if there are no questions then i will end the session now thank you so much